Before we get started, one question. Any non-German speakers here? Okay, welcome. So this will be in English for you. <laughs> so you have to put up with my bad German tinted English. Second question. You know this is about failing, not about success. Yeah? You, you know this. Okay. No surprises there. I'm David. You find me on the internet, König Hotze, even on PlayStation if you want to play FIFA. I work as a principal architect for Zenacor, a consultancy based in Germany and um, Austria. And principal architect, that means full stack, PowerPoint, Excel, Word. <laughs> Some disclaimers. Um, this is about project anecdotes. Everything I present here has happened on my projects. Mainly I was the cause, as always. This does not imply that this won't work for you. So I don't insult you. If I hate JavaScript, it's not an insult, okay? What's the story? The story is your boss wants to modernize. You know, he's always reading books, stuff like this, and he wants to do stuff, give you more work, but you don't. And I will tell you 10 simple tricks that you can do to sabotage any project with regards to digitalization or stuff like this. Okay, your boss reads about microservices. It's like this, computer week or whatever. Industry 4.0, whoa, sounds cool. And then, wow, the Google guy said, disrupt or be disrupted. I don't want to be disrupted. And then extreme AGI, cloud native digital microservices. <laughs> sounds awesome, everybody's doing cloud and agile, let's do it. And he's like, IT people, whoosh, make it happen. Build me microservices. And if you're a good developer and you want to learn about things, what do you do? Google. <laughs> and the key point is here, you must not use Google search. This, I'm feeling lucky. This is the key point here, okay? And then you will find some, some blog entries and you read about microservices, about this single bonded context and UI and services. Blah, 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 blah. I don't care. Too much work. Too many cat pictures or shaved alpacas. Just ask yourself, as I do, the simple question, do you prefer doing this or a nice hammock with cocktails? I want to do this, if you can actually see this. So the sabotage count on 10 tips, organization, processes, team collaboration, also tech stuff. Some things will work for you, some things won't. We'll see. Number 10, polyglot. Before I cover this, who is doing microservices? Awesome. In production? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And who's doing polyglot? Uh, C. In English, there is this game that's called uh, Wer's Waldo. In German, it's the Wimmelbild. It works like this. You have this picture, and there's this guy, and you have to find him. And this applies to technique. Also, so you have the team that using Phoenix and, and Postgres, Elixir, awesome tech stack, highly recommended, do this. Then those JavaScript guys who want to do isomorphic JavaScript end-to-end, -end, can't argue, Angular, happy, awesome. The last team, Spring Boot, React, and then Neo4j, who am I kidding? React is a thing of the past, it's Vue now. <laughs> uh, thank you, and we must not stop there. This is not enough. So we have Bauer, we have Gulp, we have Gradle, SPT, Maven, NPM, Webpack, and Grunt. And we should er use everything. And the cool, ki cool kids in their JavaScript projects, they combine, they use Grunt, Webpack, and Gulp in the same project. It's really cool. <laughs> and we didn't stop there. We went into production with Kubernetes, Docker, Terraform, Chef, and also Puppet. And you might say Puppet is the same as Chef. They do the same thing, provision stuff. I don't care. <laughs> and the reason why we did this is William Wallace. Who knows William Wallace? Awesome, brave heart fans here. Scottish freedom fighter, and freedom is a human right. Your teams should choose. This leads to groundhog code, where every day you solve the same technical issues. You see, if you solved authentication for Phoenix, you have to rewrite that for happy JS and then for Spring Boot, maybe. So we will be just focusing on infrastructure. Everybody hates building business value, eh? business value-driven development. Technical stuff, infrastructure, that's cool, and this is Groundhog code. And then you have these maintenance field trips. 
let's say, who, who likes React? Okay, who is Angular? More Angular? Okay, so let's say you are building Angular front end and you are sick, and the React guy over here has to fix your stuff. It's, everything is JavaScript and front end. It can't be so different, yeah? <laughs> so good luck with that. And think about synergies. So UIs, polyglot UIs with better status, where you combine Elm and Vue and, and Angular and the same thing it can lead to awesome things. Namely, friends on Stack Overflow, where you look for, for bug fix and for advice how to fix things. And lastly, I think governance and moderation, like let's just choose 10 tech stacks to overrate it, just for cowards. And if this works for you, we have semantic versioning. Who does not know what semantic versioning is? What? Okay. The basic, I, I think you know it, maybe not under this, this name. It's basically the idea that you uh, have a version where you differentiate between major, minor, and bug fix. Nothing else, nothing sophisticated. Unless you execute this command in a typical JavaScript project. I don't want to rent on JavaScript, it's for Java the same. Where you look at dependencies for your project and you are looking for version zero. And I know back 2003, when we tried Spring the first time Enterprise, and it was version 1.1, and my boss said, one point anything is too immature for production. And I think version zero is one point, uh, version one today. You are kidding me. Version 0.1.12. My GitHub projects have this version, and we're using this in production. But that's why I don't call this polyglot. I call this poly WTF because this is what happens. Number nine, data monolith. The next slide is an architectural overview of how to integrate using a database, namely this. You can see the enterprise database on the right-hand side and those two microservices <laughs> using this. <laughs> and this story goes back to a, a consultancy a contract I had in, in Frankfurt, and there was this enterprise architect, nice guy, totally cool man, and he approached me and said, Mr. Schmitz, I'm so happy. I finally migrated every application to a single Oracle SQL store. And I was like, oh, sounds cool. <laughs> yeah. It looked like this because this is really expensive. And Oracle and DB2 and all the other dat databases are expensive. And all the microservices integrate using this, this database. This can work unless we share the tables. And this is cool because then you have a consistent view on your data. Yeah? Single point of truth. And if you watch the left-hand side, you can see that account and credit, they share the same table there. It's no problem. Yeah? We have single point of truth. Everything is fine. Business is, is, is happy. And one day they came along and said, ah, the account name must be 200 characters instead of 50 characters. And the account team can decide for their own microservice. They can release on their own. And they changed their table, their table and the credit team wasn't informed. And we went into production, and this happened. <laughs> but not only, of, of course, not only credit, there were 20 services that crashed. Your mother always told you, and your father probably too, that sharing is a good thing. So share your data, integrate over your database, like in the good old days in the 80s. Avoid table or schema ownership. Ownership means responsibility. Responsibility means wake up calls at four o'clock. And you can paralyze your business side too, without them ever knowing, because they have to come up with this giant domain model. I don't know if the older guys among us, they know this, this ubiquitous domain modeling thing that was a thing in 15 years ago. And if this doesn't work, you can keep people awake for operations with insidious dependencies, like this account service executes those giant SQL queries on your database that keeps the database awake all night and every other microservice cannot work, and nobody will know what's going on unless you have really good monitoring. Awesome. Question, who's doing event sourcing? Nobody. Last week in BatConf in Berlin, there were so many people that are doing event sourcing. So I will just give you the marketing pitch. The idea is that you have an, an event store that collects business-related events without changing, like a ledger for your, your account, basic idea. Nothing new, basically. As you can see here, there's this new customer created event, and after that, there's a credit acquired event, and so on. And when a Microsoft, like customer, publishes new events, they are appended to the event store, right? No biggie there. And if there are other microservices, like in this case, credit, and they're interested in, in events from customer, they just 
build their own local read model of it. There are many intricate details, which I won't cover, but basically you get an immutable history and audit trail for free. And you have always with Microsoft this problem of how do you actually share data? How do you build a consistent view of your data? And you can decouple your microservice using CQRS. If you want to know more about those topics, come to me after this, this, this talk and we will talk. We can't do it now. 45 minutes, not enough. And this is awesome. And we are using this for many years now, for I think for five years. Until last year, business side found out that our country codes were just strings. So we had things like Bayern as a country. And the Schöner Österreich also. And they said, eh, this won't work for Swift transactions because Swift requires an ISO code. And we're like, we can't change it. So let's just add a snippet of code and customer. It was Elixir or Ruby, I don't know. And we had just some, some compensation action. That whenever something is not an ISO code, we fix it. But we have this other microservice, right? And there's a general question. How do we share code between microservices? Any idea? No. We've developed a tool on our project, which you might want to download afterwards for the Mac users. The Windows version is coming soon. This is copy and paste. <laughs> Works great. So we have this microservice over here, customer, and we have this other microservice credit, and plop, easy fix. Yeah. Thank you. Unless two months later, we had customer we had credit reporting. <laughs> and then we discovered the bug. That was really <laughs> a bad, bad weekend. <laughs> but I was on vacation, so everything is cool. <laughs> so if you are doing event sourcing, do not think about data cleansing. Data cleansing is for, for, for cowards. We don't want that. And if you need a, a success uh, a, a tip, it's just wet is the new dry. Dry is don't repeat yourself. And wet is awesome. We enjoy typing. Exactly. <laughs> Line of code is incentive. Never question the design. We were talking about bonding co context in, in the beginning. If you are copying business-related code around in the microservices, I don't think this implies that your design is crap. Don't go back to the drawing board. Just Straight ahead. And even if you have just a simple application, like for your to-do list, event source that too. Everybody is doing event source. The cool kids are doing event sourcing. I'm doing event sourcing. Yeah? And the next thing I want to give you works only for German people. So just translate eventual consistency with <laughs> eventual consistent. <laughs> and I think you'll guess, you get the, the, the meaning. Before I go on ranting about this, who has never built a framework? Ah, you are liars, everyone. <laughs> I don't believe you. Oh, you're not coders. One, one of those. Carl Sagan, famous astrophysicist, once said, if you want to build microservices, you have to build a framework. And that's what we are doing. We have, our, once again, our, our banking application. And I talked about event sourcing, but this works with persistence and everything else, too. And we build our event sourcing framework. And this is really cool, just publishes all these events. I don't know if you can read this because of those, those lights over there. It's just a JSON payload, nothing more. Until we discovered that the customer system IDs should be non-numeric, because numeric IDs are always wrong. No problem, semantic versioning, right? So we published a new version of our customer. And you cannot read this, I guess, because oh, I, guess, I think maybe you can read it. The ID is now. A string. <laughs> in the runtime, you know, separate releases, independent teams, independent integration. Yeah, in production, we started sending all these events to the other microservices. And this is the status diagram. This is totally cool because this is what I call a change the world event, a single business event that actually forces you to update everything. Works for Spring Boot too. So, Independent, who, who's doing Scrum? It's awful. Every two weeks or so a release. Back in the days, waterfall, one release a year, everything went smooth. I don't want this. <laughs> this is cool. You see? The account team is, is, is done, two weeks vacation, and then there's this big bang. And you know, 
who's working for a consultancy? I'm working for a consultancy. This needs a release manager. I'm talking day rates. <laughs> bling, bling. So dependencies are social tools. If you depend on other people, on our frameworks, this is a good thing. And in the digital age, we are losing our jobs to automation to somebody else. If you write invasive frameworks, job insurance, write those. And it's fun. And if you lack ideas, here are some ideas, for, especially for, for a Java audience, collection frameworks, string utils, and logging. Of course, ORM after Hibernate, there wasn't so much. And for the JavaScript guys, and maybe even for the Java guys, we need a new UI framework. After JSF and Wicked, there was nothing. And if you lack the time, like, like I do, for, for frameworks, invent new date formats. <laughs> okay. Next question. Who is actually deploying to the cloud? Public or on-premise? I don't care. Oh, it's increasing. OK. So once again, for us, us consultants, here's a bonus tip for your revenue. Does anybody know this WKTP method, uh, KPT method? No, no, I don't think so. It's just simple advice. You have to split between who wants something to be done, who knows how to do this, who has the required privileges, root access, and who has the time to actually do this. And if you split this into four person, four day rates, money. <laughs> so continuous delivery is great. Clever insight, yeah, it's really new. And this is what we did. I just abbreviated. We had some Git, Jenkins, Ansible, provision our production environment. And the rest of the world? This is not the whole story. Yeah? We are doing cloud. And of course, we're doing cloud because we have OSs, we have databases, we have load balancers, reverse, reverse proxies, and our Docker host. And we talked among ourselves and we said, soulless automation like robots. Nobody can be proud of automation, right? So on the right-hand side, we wanted some, some love. <laughs> Before I explain to you what we did, who is not familiar with cattle, not pets? Everybody know? Oh, no. The basic idea is, from, from the automation guys, awful, that they think back in the days when you had your server and had a funny name, like Donald Duck 123, and if there was a change, you SHH into the machine and you change the ETC route config and whatever, and you shouldn't do this. Because today what we do is, if a server dies, we kill it like cattle. And I don't, don't agree. Just ask yourself, whom do you love more? Him? Or him? <laughs> I'm not a vegetarian, but... Anyway, the uh, business side once again wanted a new release of the customer system, hotfix, awful thing, don't want to get into details. And of course, we were doing Agile, so we had a separate DevOps team <laughs> that were not part of the feature team. And the question is, how do we communicate efficiently with the DevOps team? Any ideas? Of course, everybody is doing this. <laughs> Tickets. So we are like, Excuse me. Hey, DevOps people, new microservice. You find it attached to this ticket, maybe. And please adjust Nginx slash customer. And they open their sophisticated automation tool, VI, and Nginx configuration. And they edited the microservice. And for those of you who can't see it, and this is true, huh? it's a slight typo. <laughs> and they did it per stage. Integration stage, production, every time, VI, not copy-paste. The next slide is a Kibana excerpt of the production status the day after. It looked like this. <laughs> On the right-hand side, you can see our production owner, and <laughs> she wasn't too happy. Infrastructure is expensive. We should be proud to take care of it. If you have a big new car, you clean it per hand, with your hand. You don't go into the washing room or whatever. And if somebody asks, Microsoft Word supports macros. This is automation, yeah? And I, I'm 40 now, and there are always these young guys say, hey, let's automate. And I say, we're not Google. Stand back. Maybe 20, 30 or something like this. And if you combine this with polyglot ops, who knows polyglot ops? Great. I will give you this tip. Maximum chaos. This is a cheat sheet from Xebia Labs. All the ops tools. And I suggest if you want to choose tools, just pick Dart files and throw them. <laughs> works. 
So next topic, the distributed monolith. I think this is not controversial. Um, everybody's doing this. We had these three, basically 20 microservices that all depended on this authorization service down here. That took care of login, logout, session, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean. And the cool thing is we, we already built this login form using React, a single page application just for this login field, you know, name, password, must be a single page app. Uh, it's egal. So business decided to offer a new discount to new users. So they had to register and la la la. And it looked like this. So first day, people were aware of this, so they logged into and the authorization service said, oh, no problem, can deal with this. And then we were on guidesites.de and more people were aware of that and authorization said, well, I'm just a Tomcat, so what, 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 what can I do? And you imagine this was distributed and the next day authorization made boom. And this led to customer boom and to credit boom and everything went boom. <laughs> this sounds funny, but this was really, really bad because the application was not for a financial institute, for, for a health institute. So they couldn't actually register new patients. So <laughs> it was not the happiest day, basically. Anyway, if you do this, you can combine the disadvantages of microservices with the disadvantages of monoliths. You get a <laughs> really complex, rigid, fragile entity. The network is reliable. I never have network issues, not on the train. <laughs> Dependency injection is a good thing, so we depend on other things. And if I say to you something as stable as concrete, this sounds good, yeah? Right? Concrete never breaks, or does it? And at the end, if the technician approaches, you can always say, synchronous dependencies, I can debug. Asynchronous, decoupled machines, oh, so, so difficult. And as always, circuit breakers are overrated. Half a system, wah, I don't like it. Who's building single page applications? Everybody is doing it, so this is for you. Actually, I find this at, at every, no, not at every, but most of our customers are doing like this. They say, oh, we have our microservice, and microservice is just Docker with some REST interface. And those script kits, not shaved, funky pants, they know nothing, so they can do their portal stuff. And as always, there's the business side with the requirement like a mandatory social security number. But there's always the other business side, and they're not so mandatory. In some cases, it should be optional. And this leads to a comprehensive UI domain model, where you struggle to find one domain model for the whole user interface. And this has to integrate both the customer domain, the account domain, the credit domain. Just think about, sometimes the social security number is there, sometimes it isn't. How do you deal with this? Where should the logic go? Any thoughts? Where do you put it? Yeah, right. But this is just the first step. Put something there, and there, and there. And why? Only then is the domain spread around, and you get a UI-driven monolith. It's look, it looks um, uh, somehow distributed and componentized, but actually you have to release everything at all. Microservice, the point is microservices are REST only. Yeah, microservice. REST service, not React service, doesn't exist. Avoid things like UI composition or self-contained systems with client-side transclusion. Don't work too hard and pff, sounds boring. And if you have some test colleagues, they want to earn money too, they have families, keep them awake with side effects. <laughs> Mutable state, awesome. And who, who considers himself or herself as a back-end developer? And then, then I'm talking to you. This is a single point of failure. At the end, it's always the script kits, okay? <laughs> okay, next question. Um, who's an architect? What is an architect, by the way? I am an architect, and you know the next sentence. There's always some Java developer Monday morning, and he approaches me and says, David, we need to migrate to Java 7, it's 2017. And I said, too risky. This is what I call developer madness. They come to us with, with blockchain, actors, cloud, struts, and I can't handle this. You know, 
um, this is too difficult, too, too much to read. So I've developed this, this technique of an architecture and design sanity sieve. I can only argue that you should apply this too. And it works like this. You have these ideas, and somehow you have to extract the good ideas from those things to bleeding edge, right? right? So I do this, like this. It works perfectly. <laughs> and every time, same result. I don't know why. So frustrate your coworkers. If you're an architect, and I have children, and when I come Monday mornings into the office, I'm, uh, you know, stressed from the weekend. And if somebody approaches me and says, hey, great idea, let's do this. And I say, no. <laughs> Instant stress relief. And those guys will leave your company rather quick, so you're back to your normal duty. It's cool. And at the end, at least I'm working for big companies, and this is real enterprise, so we can't migrate to Java 7. <laughs> and there's always this, this thing about ivory towers. Yeah, ivory tower of architecture, blah, blah. Everybody knows unendliche Geschichte, never-ending story. Yeah, there's this ivory tower. It's a thing of beauty. I like living in the ivory tower. <laughs> Developers, don't get them. <laughs> so let's take the business monolith. Any business people here now? I think this is a dev only conf, no? So I can say this. Business people may understand complex insurance or banking products or whatever, but be sure, we are technicians. We are smarter than everybody else, right? So, so we shouldn't involve those people in our microservice design. So we cobble up our microservices, but the key is do not inform the business side. Because this will happen. We have the business side once again. Let's do an, an, a, a valid address for the user. And this was a, a, an application for um, building houses. And the problem is sometimes a house can have an address and sometimes not. If the, for example, if there's no road to, the, to your house, then it's just a so-called floor number. And there's the other side who says, no, we, we can't always force the user to enter address because it doesn't work. And then this happens. All the business people come together and they look at this big blob and they're like, what can we do? There's a technical term for this, requirements ping pong. <laughs> How do we approach something like this? Oh, any idea? Tickets, Tickets work, great. <laughs> Change management. Excel files, not tickets. <laughs> and requirements management. And why? Tickets can be automated, but these are people, day rates. <laughs> and the key is this works with ops too. And this is a true story. We had these microservices, once again, banking industry, and the ops guy just saw this, some product, whatever. And they are like, eh, it's Friday, Friday is our deploy time, so what the hell, <laughs> deploy everything. Really, even the snapshot versions, everything to product. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't blame them, they, don't, they didn't know that. This is what I call the water scrum fall. <laughs> you get the meeting, the, the meaning. Yeah? So basically, avoid cross-functional teams. They are hell, I don't want to work with the business side. They, they're always pff. slow, means more time for Twitter. You remember? Cat pictures. <laughs> and the servant of many kings is a free man, as you may know. And last but not least, Conway's law, everybody knows Conway's law, yeah? where architecture follows organization and vice versa, so use it to your advantage. <laughs> huh? Nobody has said that you should improve. So the last topic for today is the so-called stuffing monolith. And I think for most great or uh, rather large organizations, this is the way we are working right now. At least this is the most difficult thing to change. And the basic idea is that you have a PMO or an HR department that says, eh, we are looking for React developers or Spring Boot developers or whatever developers instead of craftswomen. And this leads to the following. You have your business in Hamburg because Jungfernstieg is nice in the morning. And the front end developers are in Dresden because all the young people are there and I have to adjust this after the, I guess after the last election I have to move to somewhere else. <laughs> No political statement. And service development is in Munich because Weissbier. And test is in Krakow because somehow we have to integrate a language barrier too. And the DevOps team, you remember, is sitting in Frankfurt because there is an AWS uh, region there. 
And you may ask, why? I can tell you, I'm a consultant, I know this. There's a clear reason for that, bonus programs. <laughs> But this, this can work, I've seen this work, so you have to make sure that you follow my three-step guide to dysfunctional teams. Step one, how do these teams communicate? Web, web, ooh, nice, WebEx. <laughs> ooh, even better than my approach. I would suggest Word. You know, how do we document REST interfaces? Never. <laughs> Great. No, seriously. Swagger? Really? No. Word. Force the developers to, to document their interfaces using tables. And you'll see JSON structures and tables work really awesome. T -t totally good. <laughs> so second of all, protect the teams. They are precious. So you have these front-end teams building front-end microservices, service microservices, and those database guys. <laughs> Establish walls. They must not communicate. <laughs> For communication, we have bureaucracy, right? Product owners. <laughs> Layered product owners. And why? Day rates. You get it. <laughs> and then we ask, what if this works? There's a final key you have to... to, to imply the final tool you have to use, namely the fake holder. <laughs> a fake holder is a person that acts as somebody who can actually decide things, but never talk to the actual customer or to the business side. He just, eh, do it somehow. And it works like this. We have this product owner for your team, your team, your team, yeah, layered, and they must not talk to each other. We establish that. So they talk to another UX product owner or back product owner, and they may talk on a bi-monthly basis to the business owner. Danger, this can work unless you apply the gradient, cannot decide, and he shouldn't care. <laughs> the cool part is, this even sounds agile, you know? <laughs> But we are technicians. Are there technical benefits? Of course there are. And we have established all these, these walls. Maybe we can do some, some EGB communication up there and totally cool. This leads to shared stability. You know, sharing is a good thing, you remember? Because if service fails, everything will fail. If database fails, everything will fail. If front end fails, eh, how do we access the services? This leads to a shared release. You remember, release managers. Everything ties into each To, to everything else. And convoluted domains. If you have just this horizontal layer and this horizontal layer and another horizontal layer, where's the domain? Huh? Where's Waldo? Programmers hate other people unless they are programmers. So I don't want to meet them, I don't want to talk to them, especially if they are from, from, other, from other, out of town. I'm from Düsseldorf. You can see me talking here is really difficult. Uh, I'm, uh, play find the domain. Say that there's a, a bug in your system. The, the business partner entity behaves buggy. Yeah. <laughs> Find the business partner domain. And I'm married, and when I come home and I tell my wife, oh, I've just coded the whole day, and she's like, oh, sounds interesting, I'm off. <laughs> But if I come home and say, I was in a war room the whole day, <laughs> or in a tiger task force, she's like, my husband. The <laughs> The man. And never take up real ownership. This is, this is key. Yeah? And last but not least, in case of bugs. Exactly. It's always the other team side. Once again, service people. Huh? It's either the ops guy who screwed up the database or the front-end kiddies who know nothing. JavaScript. Huh? So, <sighs> wrapping up. Oh, we have some time left, basically. Great. Um, this is a rant, but there are methods to approach every topic and fix this. This is not a secret. This is just not well documented, and I think everybody is learning it f for his or her organization themselves. I think the industry is lacking discipline there. Back in the, back in the days, yeah, you know, um, I don't know if you have seen the talk in, in Cinema One um, 
about starting up an enterprise, la la la, and he was talking about you have to unlearn stuff. And this is key. There are architects like myself, and they say, well, this is nothing new. No SQL databases are not new. We've been using graph databases in the 70s. And this is not true. This is something completely different. Microservices are not about programming language or, or, or technique. They're a way of working. Feature teams are a way of working. There's not just 10 lines of code. But the key to failure is always the hidden monolith. And this is not documented. You have to be sure that microservices, they sound easy. You go to start Spring.io and you download a zip file and bam, your REST service is up in production and it will fail terribly. Microservices are terribly hard. If you think about distribution, about um, finding things, naming things, how do you actually provide the semantics on your, on your, on your architecture? Who's using Kubernetes? Do you enjoy this? I, I think it's an awesome piece of techni technology. I, I wouldn't be able to write this, but seriously, guys, I think there might be some CRUD applications out there that need to be written. Not, not everything has to be cloud native. And if you are like me, I don't work in greenfield environments. This is the perfect excuse. If somebody wants to change something, go and say, it's brownfield, it doesn't work here. Yeah, so this is something you, you definitely should keep in your arsenal. Never talk to people. The other people are hell. You don't want the ops guy. Establish a DevOps team. Yeah, just talk to them via Word documents. Um, who has a well-established operations team with enough people that actually are able to optimize their production environment? <laughs> really? We need to talk. Because whenever I go to our customers, there's just this team of 10 people who are just running around sweating all day. And we are the, as developers are coming, well, pfft, here's Docker. And they're like, we are using web logic. <laughs> What's a Docker? <laughs> uh, and that's reality. So this is a good, good thing. And I read this a lot. Microservices are fine-grained service-oriented architecture. Yeah. Like in the first approach, everything is a ball. Uh, <laughs> what? So basically, what I want to give you on your, on your way home today, on the rest of the conference, Embrace the monolith, both in mind and in way of working. This is, this is important. Not just think monolithic, yeah? like how can we fix things, wicked struts, but also just build walls around your teams. Don't involve business, don't involve operations, don't involve the test guy. Like <laughs> I read, I have a couple of minutes left. I read this article, you know DevOps teams, real DevOps teams, developer and operations sitting together. And now uh, a business associate of mine, he came up with the, this biz ops sec, like a security officer sitting in the team. And now we have biz dev ops sec and what were pairs for persistence. And I'm like, there is a term for that cross-functional team. Yeah? So, and they're discovering this now. We have to stress this unless you want to fail. So um, there are two topics more I could cover, but I won't because they are, and we are recorded, so <laughs> I won't go into them <laughs> because they are controversial. Um, I hope you are not disappointed. I don't know if you wanted to learn anything. <laughs> this is for the rest of the conference, okay? So thank you for your attention. I have nothing more. <laughs>